My name is Kent Mullenix and I'm the director of the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Sustainability is humanity's premier challenge. We've got to figure out how to live on the planet without uh, jeopardizing future generations' ability to do the same. Undoubtedly, the foundation of any semblance of human sustainability is a sustainable food system. All other human enterprises emanate from our ability to uh, provide sustenance to ourselves. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Tell Us World of Science. Thank you all for coming on this glorious summer night. My name is Pauline Finn and I'm the Vice President of Community Engagement here at Science World. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to say a few words about this partnership with Kwantlen Polytechnic University, KPU. Uh, Science World is a not-for-profit and a mission-based organization, and we're committed to exploring really creative ways to work with the science community to bring more science here into our facility, to be a clubhouse for science and innovation. And this innovative experiment of working collaboratively together to host this adult lecture series is one of the ways we are playing around and experimenting. And Kwantlen has been an absolutely amazing academic partner uh, in this journey for us. It's also my job to remind everyone, if you've got one of these, I think probably one or two of you do, maybe. Uh, if you could turn it off, that would be great. I'm gonna do that myself. And I will pass the microphone over to my colleague, Betty Warabek, the Dean of Science at KPU, uh, with pleasure to give you a little bit more information about tonight's presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Pauline. Um, welcome here. This is the second installment of the speaker series, and I'm here to tell you a little bit more about that, but also here to introduce our speaker. I'm going to have to read some of this, so I, I apologize for that, because as you see, um, when we hear about our speaker, there's lots that we need to know about him and, and um, how lucky we are to have him with us today. So again, on behalf of KPU, welcome here. Um, KPU would also like to acknowledge the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. This is the federal government agency who provided the funding uh, for this speaker series. And this is based on an application by uh, Dr. Daniel Bernstein, the Canada Research Chair in Lifespan Cognition, and Dr. Rajiv um, Janjiani, both faculty members at our, in our psychology department. So um, I think both Danny and, and Rajiv are here today, and, and I think they'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. I don't know, maybe they can, Danny's here for sure. Okay, thanks. Um, another thing I'd like to mention before I, I introduce Kent is that each of you would have received a bag when you arrived tonight, and inside there is a survey. And what we would like you to do is fill that in at the end of the evening and then um, submit the survey as well as there is an entry form for a draw um, at the bottom of that and uh, we'll be collecting those after tonight. This, the speaker series um, is a bit of a study and the survey helps in, in doing the analysis of, of these adult programs, um, outreach between science and, and the public. So some of the questions will help us with our other speaker series that are coming up, but also will help um, in the analysis of this experiment that you're taking part of. Um, tonight is the second installment, and there's many more to come. So also within your package, you'll find the list of all the speakers that are coming up. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. But my main reason to be here is to introduce you to Dr. Kent Mullenix. Kent is the director of the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at KPU. Um, he is engaged in research and development to advance sustainable agriculture and food systems. Before joining us at KPU, Kent held the endowed joint chair in palmology and was an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at the Washington State University. Kent was also the founding director of the Institute for Rural Innovation and Stewardship in North Central Washington, 
with the focus on advancing family-based agriculture predicated upon environmental stewardship and community sustainability. Kent's specific areas of research and other scholarly work include development of ecologically sound, human-intensive horticulture food crop production methods, development of bioregional agri-food systems, including both urban and peri-urban agriculture, and family-based agriculture revitalization as a critical element of sustainable agriculture and community. Additionally, Kent is an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia and serves on the editorial board of the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture Journal. Kent was instrumental in developing and implementing the Bachelor of Applied Science in Sustainable Agriculture at KPU, and this is the first degree of its kind in North America. So there's information on this program. You may have seen it in, in one of the booths when you first came in. Kent has authored numerous scientific, technical, educational, and lay publications, and is frequently invited to speak on topics such as sustainable agriculture. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Kent Mullenix, and we'll be looking forward to a wonderful talk. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, Dean Warbeck. I appreciate it. That's a lot more than you really need to know about me, let me tell you. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and to uh, share my thinking about sustainability and food systems and their intersection. And um, I've got a lot to share with you, so I'm going to try to move pretty quickly. And I think the place to begin is with the concept of sustainability, because that's really going to be the focus of my work and the focus of uh, what I want to share with you. And I believe um, quite, quite uh, uh, adamantly that sustainability is humanity's premier challenge. We have, uh, we have got to figure out how to live on the planet without compromising the ability of future generations' ability to do the same. And we're, we're nowhere close to that at this juncture in time. Uh, most folks would offer that the sustainability has an environmental uh, pillar, a, an economic pillar, and a social pillar, and otherwise, it, uh, otherwise it has to be a sustainable future has to be environmentally uh, sound and, and economically viable and socially equitable or just. And so it is through the, the, that this lens that I will be examining agriculture and our food system and, and offering a vision for a, a sustainable food system future. I want to also say that sustainability is a goal. It's, it's not an end point. It's something that we must always work toward. And I also want to say that, that it's very, very difficult to offer what is sustainable or what will be sustainable. And so I can't tell you what a sustainable food system future really is. But I, but I can offer what I think will contribute to it. But what we can do, absolutely, is assess the sustainability of our contemporary food system or the contemporary elements of the human enterprise. And I'm going to spend a lot of time tonight looking at the sustainability of our contemporary food system because it is understanding that food system that will inform our thinking and our action to create a sustainable food system. So whereas I don't know what a sustainable food future really is, I do have the ability and you have the ability to look at our contemporary food system and assess its sustainability and in doing so uh, uh, develop your thinking about an appropriate food system future to advance our sustainability. I want to offer that also uh, the last word on this issue of sustainability. It is, it is our premier challenge and I, and I, I would suggest that it, a sustainable food system really is the foundation of humanity's sustainability. We, we have to figure out how to um, produce and procure our sustenance before we uh, really figure out anything else. And so a sustainable food system is job one because all elements of the human enterprise emanate from our ability to produce food 
and procure our sustenance. So we've really got to figure this one out. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, in my estimation. So food systems uh, are, are a lot more than just agriculture, although we tend to think of food systems as, as agriculture, but it really involves all the inputs. It involves the resources, uh, land, water, air, uh, uh, minerals, et cetera, the, the biota, the, the ecological interface of them. It includes uh, uh, fertilizers and fuels and machinery and people, all the inputs, certainly production agriculture, the processing, the storage, the distribution, the sales systems, you're buying it, you're preparing it, eating it, the waste recovery and recycling system, all of these elements are part of our food system. And they, and they, they operate in an integrated way. Uh, not necessarily a functionally, uh, functionally from a sustainability standpoint, but they do operate in, uh, in integration with one another. But our discussion about a sustainable food system has to start with agriculture, and uh, uh, because it is the basis of uh, our, our food system. And I, I want to share with you that agriculture as a human endeavor is about 11,000 years old. And it developed in areas that uh, have had for that 11,000 years relatively constant and stable climate and weather. And crops and stock are produced in areas that, have, uh, uh, that are replete with uh, high quality arable soil and um, it's, it's in these areas with stable climate and weather and good soils that agriculture has uh, developed and has been sustained for 11,000 years. The modern food system that feeds us is about 60 years old. The, it, it, it's, it's also known as, as uh, uh, well, it's call, often referred to as the production paradigm system, production agriculture, but it's also known as conventional agriculture or, or industrial agriculture, food system, and uh, global agriculture, the global food system. But the point is, it's only about 60 years old. Certainly it has uh, uh, grown from the, the traditional uh, agriculture that existed in the previous uh, 10,940 years, but the system that predominates now is about 60 years old, the, the, the wholesale industrialization of agriculture. And this agriculture, production agriculture, industrial agriculture, developed uh, per this meta-ethic to produce food to feed the world at any cost. I'm in my fourth uh, decade as an agricultural si agriculturist and an agricultural scientist and uh, uh, studied agriculture in the 70s when agriculture was making a transition uh, to, to, an, to its industrialization, its wholesale industrialization. And this is the mantra that all of us young agriculturists were taught. We have got to feed the world. We've got to feed the world. That is what we do. That's our noble, noble endeavor. So it uh, is valuable for us to uh, examine how that has worked out. And certainly the production of food is the, is the um, absolutely is the bright spot in the industrialization of agriculture. Industrial agriculture produces a lot of food. But ultimately, and, and in fact, uh, 3,200 calories for every man, woman, and child on earth is produced. That's enough for way more than the world's population needs to, uh, to exist. In fact, if we all ate 3,200 calories a day, uh, we might be a lot larger than we are. Yet, uh, a sixth of the world's population is food insecure every day. A million children starve to death every year, to death. And then another sixth of the, of the world's population approximately overeats. So, so the, the fact of the matter is, we haven't fed the world with this industrial agriculture. We've produced a lot of food, but we haven't fed the world's population. Essentially, we've created an agriculture system 
that is prepared to feed only those that are sufficiently affluent. And that is not a sustainable food system. What is more, the food that is being produced in the industrial system is not as nutritious as it once was. The studies are, are, are beginning to reveal that the nutritional quality of the foods that are produced in the industrial system simply do not have the same nutrient density that they once did. And, and uh, uh, fruits, vegetables, animal protein, milk, meat, uh, the, the, the nutrition is not as good. What, what we can attribute this to remains unclear. Uh, whether the, the soils are mined out or it's the cultivars that are being used in the production system or the methods of production, we don't know. But the fact of the matter is, foods are, are, are increasingly not as nutritious as they once were. And the poster child for this is spinach. And I don't know, uh, some of you all that are my age will, will know that we were told to eat our spinach to get iron so that we could be big and strong when we grew up. Well, uh, when I was growing up, there was a lot of iron in spinach, and there's very little iron in spinach now. And we're seeing this nutrient dilution effect in, in uh, many foods. We also are experiencing the suite of Western diseases, coronary heart disease, uh, onset childhood diabetes, type 2 diabetes, obesity, all epidemic in North America. And these are food-related diseases, not exclusively uh, 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 the, uh, caused by our food system, but certainly uh, our food system contributes to it. Uh, lifestyle contributes to it and other things. But without a doubt, our food system is linked to it. And Kate Clancy, the Union of Concerned Scientists, has, has espoused the thinking that perhaps for the first time in history, our children will not live as long as we do because of our food system and the foods that we are eating. So, so let me shift gears now and, and, and look at the economics of agriculture and our food system. The fact of the matter is, in British Columbia, in Canada, and around the world, agriculture increasingly is an economic uh, loser. And, and for, for example, uh, in British Columbia in 2010, uh, the industry grossed $2.5 billion, but it lost $87 million. It's a losing proposition, and, in, and, and increasingly it's a losing proposition. And this is happening in British Columbia, it's happening in Alberta, it's happening in every province of Canada, it's happening in every state in the United States, and it's happening in every country of the world. It, it just so happens that in British Columbia the only uh, commodities that were profitable were the supply managed commodities, milk, poultry, and eggs. And of course that's because it's, it's a, it's a state-facilitated uh, monopoly. One of the reasons why this is occurring is because agriculture has become incredibly, incredibly capital and input intensive. Uh, in the form of uh, fuel, machinery, pesticides, fertilizer, and land. And the net result of this in capital-intensive, input-intensive agriculture, let me see if I can find the, the uh, pointer, is that the, uh, the, the gross re farm receipts, uh, uh, our cost of production, this, this ochre line, has gone up, 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 up from 1926 to 2010. This is what farmers spend to produce the food that you eat in Canada. This is the gross receipts that they get for it, mirrors what they spend. This is their net profit line. From, 2000, or from 1926 to 2010, what can you tell me about the net profit line? It is flat. Farmers have not made money for 50 years in Canada. And if you graph the same data in the United States, it would be exactly the same curve. If you graph this in Japan, it would be exactly the same curve. If you graphed it in from Germany, it'd be the same curve. It'd be this curve, this curve uh, would exist for around the world. This, this, I'm sorry, I keep doing this. Uh, this difference represents tremendous risk 
to farmers. When the cost of production and the profit potential are close together, farmers can withstand the vagarities of, of, of weather-related crop loss or a, a market failure, et cetera, et cetera, not getting what they expect for uh, their crops. But when the difference between the cost of production and your profit potential is this great, there is no wiggle room. And this is exactly why two or three market or crop failures in a row result in farms going into receivership. And, and we are seeing a record number of family-based farms going under for this reason. What is more, this input intensive agriculture has resulted in what we describe as the technology treadmill. And essentially the tre tre uh, technology treadmill works like this. Uh, innovative uh, technologies are developed, they increase productivity on the farm, early adopters profit from it, then every farmer in BC adopts it or wherever, and it increases production on the whole, increased production depresses prices, and farmers make less per unit of production, and yet their cost of production goes up, up, up. So they end up with spending all of this money on technology, producing more crop that's worth less, and their bottom line is negative. And that's the technology treadmill. And, and the, the best case in point that I can share with you is pesticides. We, with the industrialization of agriculture, we, we began the wholesale use of pesticides. Now, I want to tell you, we've been using pesticides for 11,000 years. But the wholesale industrial use of pesticides started about 60 years ago, maybe even less than that. And, and, and from the beginning of the industrialization of agriculture through the first decade or so, pesticide use increased tenfold. Folks just started using it. And during the same time, crop losses due to, due to pests doubled. And so what Robert Vandenbosch had to say about this, who's the father of integrated pest management, the, the study of, of ecological basis for pest management, said this is what we got for the adoption of these technologies, a doubling, a doubling of, the, of the problem. And, uh, but, and farmers spend a huge amount of money on these technologies, but it doesn't increase their profitability. And the evidence of the lack of efficacy of these technologies is increasingly documented. There, there are 270 weed species that are resistant to the herbicides, over 150 disease species that are resistant to, anti to antibiotics and, and fungicides, and, and over 500 insect pest species that are now resistant to insecticides. And the genetically modified crop plants uh, that, that now have been engineered to manufacture their own insecticide after only 15 years are failing. And, and, and the agricultural scientists who developed this technology knew that would occur. And it represents literally a, a money grab for inputs, if you ask me. So what uh, uh, Pearson and Nasby had to say at the University of Guelph was that farmers' faith in this production paradigm has really impoverished them and exposed them to incredible risk that's resulted in the failing of, of, of farms. And this failing, and, 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 and not only has, has uh, the economics of, of production uh, being felt, but, but it's caught, this food is costing us more money, too. It's affecting our personal economies. Food is costing more and more and more because of the cost of production. And so your food dollar literally increasingly is flowing through the farm to the headquarters of the, of the input suppliers and the, and the marketers and post-production folks. And, and so in, in 2008, 
when overall Canadian inflation was 1.2 percent, uh, food inflation was 7 percent, and fruit and vegetable inflation was a whopping 27 percent. And, and in recent years, the promise of cheap food for the masses through industrialization is proving to be a dream. And you can expect food prices to increase, 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 particularly with uh, 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 some of the other pressures that we'll talk about later. So you may be asking then, if farmers aren't making money, and food, and I'm spending a huge amount of, on food. I, I, I have a, a, a young uh, adult son who eats an incredible amount of, of food, and, I, and I, I know what the bill is. And, and, and I'm sure some of you all do too, and you're probably at, well, where does my food dollar go? Well, uh, about eight cents of every food dollar that you spend goes to the farmer. And I can tell you that, that as the graph should have suggested to you, that's not enough to keep the farm going. That's not enough to cover the costs of production and generate an income for the farm-er or the farm family. It used to be before the industrialization of agriculture that farmers got about 40 cents of every food dollar and that's why we had a robust family-based agriculture system in Canada and the United States but that doesn't exist anymore. The, the, the money now goes to the inputs, fuel, fertilizers, pesticides, machinery, and increasingly to marketing. You're actually spending your food dollar so that the transnational corporations can convince you to spend your food dollar. And that's where your money is going. In fact, in the US, food companies spend $500 in marketing for every one dollar that we spend, uh, taxpayers spend to teach people how to eat well. The amount of money going into marketing and inputs uh, in agriculture and the food system is astronomical. So all of this uh, economic system uh, has spurred uh, the economics of, of agriculture and, and, and the, the, the risk and the pressure in agriculture and, and, the, and the technology treadmill creating a, a, a low margins on the units of production on the farm has resulted in what Earl Butts, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture under Nixon, admonished agriculturists to do is, this is a business, get bigger or get out. And that's exactly what has happened in Canadian agriculture in BC agriculture, in US agriculture, and in agriculture around the world. And the net result is we're losing farms rapidly. And the farms that we're mostly losing are those that we describe as farms in the middle. They are the traditional family farms. And you can see that what we're gaining is highly consolidated industrial farms. This is, this is, this is where uh, uh, all of these farms as they fail get snatched up by the big players and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. There is a second group of, of farms that are growing and it's small farms and this is an encouraging trend to me. As discouraging as this is, as discouraging as this is, this is encouraging to me for a sustainable food system future. Again, I could, this, this, is, this is BC. I could reproduce the, the similar graph for Alberta and every province in Canada. I could produce a similar graph for the United States, a similar graph for almost any country of the world because this is an artifact and a, a result of the industrialization of agriculture. And it has, it has resulted in the gutting of agricultural communities literally the gutting of agricultural communities. Main, main streets boarded up and becoming uh, dust towns, ghost towns. We're also seeing with the, with the consolidation of agriculture an exodus of people from the profession of farming. And the folks that are, are able to hang in there are, are old established farmers. And so the average age of farmer in Canada and the United States is about 55. A little bit older in BC, actually, and and they're getting ready to retire, and there there there's not 
a, a next generation in the wings. There simply isn't. They, they only, and, and this segment, this demographic is only 1.5% of our population. Biologically, that's not even enough to reproduce. That's not even a replacement population. So then we have to ask ourselves, where, where, where are farmers going to come from? This is a knowledge intensive, technically sophisticated profession. And, and it's doubly troubling because as we move into a sustainable food system future, we know that that, that agriculture and that food system is going to be even more knowledge intensive, require even more technical expertise, knowledge and technical expertise of a different nature, but absolutely a knowledge intensive endeavor. And uh, we're going to need it. And the question is, where are we going to get it? And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about agriculture's environmental record. Suffice it to say that uh, there are those that have offered that the single most destructive human activity that has ever occurred on the face of the earth is agriculture. But certainly the record is replete. Uh, habitat and biodiversity destruction, pesticide and fertilizer contamination. There are 405 epoxic zones in the world's oceans dead from agriculture runoff. The epoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico is 70 square miles. It used to be one of the most productive fisheries on the face of the earth. And it now is a dead ocean body. Uh, soil erosion, salinization, desertification are occurring at record rates around the world due to uh, agriculture, all, all uh, complement of agricultural activities. Uh, the the, the uh, intensification of animal production and confined animal uh, operations uh, is resulting in, in noxious waste that, that were unimaginable 20 years ago, uh, pollution of air, water. Uh, we are, we are, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we're pumping the world's aquifers and fresh water streams dry for agriculture and we're unleashing the, uh, the, the world's greatest biological experiment in nature with genetically modified organisms with no idea of what is going to happen ultimately and, uh, and, and greenhouse gas emissions are all, all, all part of the, the environmental challenges of, of the industrial agriculture system. And, and we seem to have faith in, in the market being able to rectify these transgressions or these deficiencies in the systems, but the fact of the matter is market forces are failing to rectify these challenges, or address or these challenges or, or, or to rectify the deficiencies. And I would offer it's, it is because of the monopolistic control of the, agri, uh, the transnational agri-food system. In North America, four corporations control 80% of beef packing. Three corporations control 75% of pork packing. Four corporations, 62% of flour milling in North America. Five, four, four corporations control 60% of food retail in Canada. And on and on. These are monopolies. And as Fred Kirschman of the Leopold Center for um, Sustainable Agriculture would offer, they don't operate for the interest of Mother Nature. They don't operate for in your interest or my interest. They operate per the interest of their corporate mandate, which is profitability. That's, that's their motive. And so they are not motivated to address these challenges. And in fact, legally, that's not what they're supposed to do. Uh, evidence to this is, is just the fact that last year, th these companies and others, and this Grocery Manufacturers Association with Monsanto and others, put $22 million into feeding GMO labeling for foods in Washington. They, they don't want consumers to have a choice. They don't want consumers to make informed decisions. They don't want consumers to make their own decisions, informed or otherwise. Uh, an abrogation of democracy, if you ask me. 
despite the fact that 64 countries require GMO labeling and 90 percent or plus Americans want la food labeling. There are also, so, so these represent some of the more immediate sustainability issues, social, economic, and environmental. And without a doubt, agriculture and our food system is replete with sustainability challenges in the immediate term. We also have, and, and have to acknowledge, some long-term sustainability issues, and I want to address those quickly. Uh, the first two, and I'm not going to talk about them much, is the fact that agriculture uses already 70% of the world's fresh water. And the fact of the matter is, agriculture and other uses of water have tapped it out. It's dry. We, we, are, we are pumping the ancient aquifers dry. The Ogallala Aquifer under North America is being pumped dry. It's not, it's not uh, being replenished. Uh, the Colorado River, the Rio Grande River, now does not meet the ocean on an annual basis because it's pumped dry every year. In, in, in India, in the great agricultural areas of India, uh, farmers used to have to drill down about 50, uh, 50 to 100 feet for irrigation water. They now have to drill down 1,000 feet. We are, we are over-exploiting the world's fresh water supplies for agricult agriculture. And it, and it will become, it already is, and it will become an increasingly uh, limiting factor in food production and in the sustainability of our agriculture system. And secondly, the world is farming all the land there is to farm now. There is really no more. I mean, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe. Uh, but but w we have tilled up and planted crops on all of the world's arable land and they aren't making any more of it. And when we expand agriculture into areas like the Amazon rainforest, we are absolutely uh, uh, establishing agriculture for the short term and the immediate profitability of transnational agriculture and food system interests. And, and, and those areas will only remain in viable agriculture for three or four years because those tropical soils are not suitable for agriculture. They simply aren't. So it represents a short-term uh, uh, profit motive. Climate change is going to have a tremendous impact on, sus on the sustainability of our food system. It is, it is changing, without a doubt, precipitation uh, patterns uh, in areas that rely on snowpack and snow melt for, for uh, uh, water like BC, uh, particularly in the Okanagan, all the, all the snowpack levels are going to, are, are going to decrease. We, we know this. And uh, the, the, the level four uh, drought that's being experienced in the, in the interior right now, the state of emergency that's been uh, declared in the state of Washington, the state of emergency in California are all related to the change in, in precipitation and snowpack patterns. And we can expect more and more of it and, and it become increasingly severe. Irrigation water availability, absolutely, even in an area like uh, southwest British Columbia is not going to be increasingly available, just the opposite. And in, and in fact, in some work we've done in Surrey, the single limiting factor to expanding agriculture production in the municipality of Surrey is the, is the fact that there's no more water for irrigation. Insect and disease uh, incidence is going to increase as the temperatures warm. There'll be more, more generations of, of pests. There'll be uh, pests that, that, uh, that were not pests before, uh, disease and insects. Uh, there's going to be a greater incidence of, of severe and unpredictable weather. We're already starting to see that here. Uh, a couple years ago, you couldn't get into your fields to plant your potatoes in the delta. And then uh, the, the following year, you couldn't get into the fields in Delta to harvest your potatoes because it was too wet. And uh, right now, we're experiencing a, an unprecedented, nearly unprecedented drought all through southwest British Columbia that's affecting uh, uh, crop production. 
And, and we can expect more and more of this kind of unpredictable and severe weather. And, and the fact of the matter is, as I, as I said uh, in the beginning, agriculture and cropping systems developed over 11,000 years in very predictable weather uh, patterns, climates and weather patterns, and, and in, in, in soils conducive to agriculture. And, and the crops that ha have been selected uh, were adapted to those regimes. And we now know, don't know what the regimes will be. And we don't know what crops will be adapted to the regimes that we don't know what will be. So it, it's, it's, it's all become a big, <coughs> we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. I can tell you that um, agriculture and the food system itself has played a critical role in climate change. Agriculture, industrial agriculture, contributes 10 to 15 percent of all anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And the industrial food system is estimated to contribute as much as 50 percent of all anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So the very thing that jeopardizes the sustainability of our food system, our very ability to grow food, produce food in the areas where we have been producing food for millennia, is causing its own demise and represents an incredible sustainability challenge. And we're, and we're, we're seeing the effects of this. It, it's, Temperatures have increased 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit just in, in, since 1980. We're, we're, we're now at uh, 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When I was an undergraduate student, uh, carbon dioxide was at, was at uh, 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 300, a little over 300 parts per million. So just in my lifetime, carbon dioxide concentrations have increased almost 100 parts per million. And we're on a trajectory to increase uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations to 600 parts per million. And it's estimated, and, and that, will dr that will drive an 11 degree Fahrenheit climate warming. And we expect, and though, though the science on this is not super, and, and it's, it's not clear, but, but we expect uh, a 15, 10, 15 percent reduction in crop yields with every uh, degree centigrade increase. So that, that's, that's six times 10, 60 percent decrease in crop yields if we, if we continue with business as usual, with carbon dioxide generation. And the fact of the matter is, we're, we're on that trajectory. We, we are at 400 parts per million carbon dioxide, we're well on the way to a 450 parts per million concentration, and the prediction is that that will spur uh, widespread dust bowl-like conditions that we haven't seen in a long, long time, and that will preclude production. In fact, uh, I saw just the other day um, to hold greenhouse gases at um, uh, 350 parts per million, 400 parts per million, we, we literally would have to leave all the fossil fuels in the ground now. We, and and, and we're, we don't seem to have that will. And certainly agriculture doesn't seem to have that will. So uh, bottom line is <coughs> the climate scientists are offering that, that all bets are off, and we really don't know how this is going to affect agriculture and our food system. But we in the north, and particularly in, in southwest British Columbia, have kind of thought, well, this is going to be good for us, it's going to warm up, and we're going to start growing crops that we didn't, uh, weren't able to grow here before. But uh, what, really what we're going to experience is, is incredibly wet springs, and you can't get in and, and, and sow your crops. We're going to experience incredibly wet falls, so that our crops rot, or we can't get in the fields to harvest them, and our summers are going to be incredibly hot and dry, and, and, and we won't have the irrigation water to irrigate them. And the snowpack that's going to feed agriculture in Canada's uh, AMBC's in interior is not going to exist.
and that's pretty much the way it's shaken out. And that's a pretty dire situation in terms of food system sustainability. We also have to recognize that uh, the energy used to, in, in modern agriculture is not sustainable. On, on average, we uh, use uh, five times as much energy to produce the food that you eat than we get out of it. For many of the foods you eat, the energy return on energy investment is one to 10. That, that means one unit of energy is produced for every 10 units of energy put into it. And if you are a ground beef hamburger eater, on average it takes 50 units of energy for every food unit of energy you ingest. And that energy comes primarily in the form of fossil fuels embedded in, in, in diesel, machinery, pesticides, and fertilizers. And the travesty of this is, aside from its, the, the fact that uh, uh, they aren't making any more fossil fuels, it's a limited supply, is that agriculture represents the single human enterprise that should be an energy gain because Agriculture is about cultivating green plants, those organisms that have the ability to capture radiant energy from the sun, the source of all energy on earth, and transform it into chemical energy to fuel our bodies and our systems and that of all other life on earth. And somehow, industrial agriculture has turned that eloquent relationship on its head. And it simply can't persist. It simply isn't sustainable. And this is a new phenomenon. This, this, we just did this. Cheap oil did this. And the fact of the matter is we're running out of oil. Many would offer that the world peaked on oil in about 2010. The most optimistic estimates propagated uh, by the U.S. Geologic Service would offer that the world will, will run out, will peak on oil in about 2035 or 36. The fact of the matter is the, there, there's a limited supply of oil and uh, we're running out of it. And, and we'll never run out of it. It will just become too difficult and too expensive to get out of the ground. And the first element of the human economy that will feel the effects of this is the food system. Because it never should have been industrialized in the first place. It doesn't lend itself to industrialization. It's not, it, it doesn't need this kind of energy uh, input. We can do it without it. Uh, regardless, uh, if we don't shift the way we do agriculture and our food system uh, to, to have a positive energy return on energy investment, we are in a heap of trouble. So uh, without a doubt, our, our dependence uh, use of and our dependence on fossil fuels is just not sustainable. So many call for a resurgence of local uh, bottling, canning, processing, the whole food system. And, and again, uh, folks offer that the, the challenge, the, 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 we need to develop a new kind of regenerative agriculture and food system to meet these challenges. And so the question uh, is raised, well, how can we feed the world without this industrial agriculture? This is what's feeding the world, except it's not feeding the world, right? But it's producing a lot of food. How can we do it? So, so we see there are two paradigms now. Uh, emerging on the, on the global stage, what we call an industrial or a life science intensive paradigm. This, this, this is more industry, more technology, more concentration. In fact, there are those that offer that we should actually create zones in the world that are uninhabitable and, and, and are dedicated only to, to, produ to the production of food. There are those who would offer that uh, Carl's home state of Iowa be, be wiped clean of little towns so that we can roboticize uh, tractors 
driven by satellite, or steered by satellites up and down rows. And one row would be a, uh, take a whole day to go down and then another day to come back up. There are those that offer that the industrialization is the only, the only path forward. And then there are those that would offer an ecological intensity agriculture and food system paradigm. And, and I'm not going to go through this, but you can see that they are diametrically opposed. But I do want to say that the ecological intensive paradigm uh, does not eschew technology. It, su it suggests to use a, a technology appropriately in ways that don't compromise the ecological integrity of agriculture and the food system, that don't compromise the ecological integrity of the earth. The uh, uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN has just recently come out and, and done an about face and said, uh, uh, we were wrong. We've been wrong for, for the last three or four decades. The industrialization of agriculture is not how we're going to feed the world, but we're going to feed the world through targeted empowerment and support of regional scale farming and, 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 and food infrastructure and business. This is how we're going to feed the world. We're also seeing in, in agriculture disciplines, agriculture being an applied science, a sub-discipline of agroecology emerged. Literally the study of how to organize and operate farming on an, on an, on an, in an ecologically sound way. And, and agroecology uh, will, will push an ecological agriculture paradigm. Uh, research is beginning to, to demonstrate that these ecological bases of production absolutely are just as productive as the industrial system without undermining the ecological integrity. The, the best system that we know of now is organic, and, and I'm not suggesting that organic agriculture is the end-all, be-all. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think we haven't really figured out the best way to farm, but, but the, the research is clear. Organic agriculture is just as good as conventional agriculture. And, and when it's not as good, it's, it's in the transition from conventional agriculture to organic agriculture. But once the transition is made, in many, many instances, for many, many crops, yields are greater. So the question I think we really need to ask is what kind of agriculture and food system is appropriate for uh, economically, environmentally, and socially for where I live, my life place, what we call bioregions. And so my research group literally is focused on uh, elucid delineating and elucidating the potentials of bioregional food systems. And we've started in Southwest BC and we're engaged in that work right now. And we're, we're actually trying to answer what levels of food self-reliance uh, can we achieve? What kind of economic contributions can we achieve? What kinds of jobs can we create? What kinds of businesses can we create? What kind of environmental stewardship can we advance? Developing an agriculture and a food system that operates per the environmental limitations and the ecology of southwest British Columbia, our life place. And I have to tell you, I believe that the, that the whole of the human, human economy needs to be organized around bioregionally, around life places. The, the globalization of our economy has led to the destruction of the Earth's ecosystems. There is no doubt about that in my mind. And so the solution is reorganizing the human economy to align with the ecology and the environmental parameters of the places that we live. We have no alternative, I believe. That doesn't mean that, that, that globalization of some aspects of the food system and other aspects of our economy won't exist. We've always traded food around the world. We've always traded food in, from one bioregion in British Columbia to another bioregion. There's nothing that says we can't do that. And, and in fact, in many instances, it may be environmentally and economically prudent to do so. I think that we'd be a lot better off growing apples in the Okanagan and bringing them over here and growing broccoli over here and sending it over to the Okanagan. But, but, but we need to think about food systems that are more proximal and appropriate, or proximal, proximal to and appropriate for the places we live.
And so we're, we're looking at, at bioregional food systems that are predicated on these characteristics, smaller scale farming and businesses, not transnational scale farms and businesses, that are farms that are low input and human intensive that are, that are absolutely environmentally sound that utilize not the transnational marketing channels, but alternate marketing channels, direct marketing channels, marketing channels where farmers can capture the value of food and not, and not give it away to the input suppliers and the, and the, and the marketers. That is community-centered and, and contributes to our local economy. The opportunity the opportunity is, is to capture some part of the six point five billion dollars that we spend on food in southwest BC, our bioregion, each year. And I guarantee of that six point five billion dollars that we spend each and every year, ninety eight percent of it leaves our community by the close of business each and every day and enriches the corporate headquarters located in New York and Chicago and Zurich and Berlin and wherever. So there's an opportunity, to, not, not just an ecological opportunity, but there's a tremendous economic opportunity, a tremendous business development and community development opportunity in re-regionalizing our food systems. And this is what we're trying to look at. The, 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 again, the research economic research, social research is becoming clearer and clearer. There's tremendous opportunity in doing this. So, so we're, we're looking at these potentials to uh, maximize regional food self-reliance, enhance the economy, create jobs, create business opportunity, and address critical environmental issues like greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity uh, diminution and, and nutrient cycling and, and, and uh, various things like that. So just to give you an idea of, of, of the real potential of this from a food self-reliance and economic uh, potential, we did a study in Surrey looking at Surrey's underutilized ALR land. And I don't know if you all know this, but the municipality of Surrey uh, uh, land base is fully is one-third agricultural land reserve land. It's agriculture land. And of that one-third of land, uh, about one-third of it is not farmed. And so we went and looked at all 550 parcels of what are classified as underutilized ALR land in Surrey. And we, as, we, we determined that there was about 7,000 acres of underutilized ALR land in, in Surrey. And we looked at, at each one of these parcels and determined how much of that 7,000 acres actually could be put in any kind of small scale alternate market farming and it, and it ended up being about uh, 3,300 acres. And we calculated if that were to happen, uh, if it were to be put in small scale alternate market agriculture, it would generate about 1,200 full-time equivalent jobs. It would generate about 73 million in, in net return to the farmers. 73 million, that's, that's as much as almost as, as Surrey's agriculture generates now. And it would produce enough of, of 24 farm products to feed Surrey's population for six months of the year. And if the proper processing and storage, those ancillary businesses were put in place, it could produce enough to feed all of Surrey's population, meet their demand, for 27 crops 12 months of the year. That's the potential of localized, regionalized crop production and food systems. Food self-reliance, job creation, business creation, and income generation. All for our communities. All for our communities. So we are now looking at, at uh, Southwest BC as a bioregion are ultimate uh, and, and trying to elucidate these potentials for Southwest BC, which is not an easy task. A team of uh, seven people have been working on it for two years now, economists and planners and ecologists and agroecologists and, and uh, agriculturists and food system people and nutritionists and et cetera. And, 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 and we hope to have uh, the story to tell in about a year. And then ultimately we want to do the same thing for all of British Columbia's bioregions and determine how these bioregions should best uh, relate to one another. 
to advance a sustainable food system. I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm winding this up, uh, and I, wa I want to say that, that this kind of food system is going to be very different from the industrial food system. It will be a food system that creates jobs, not eschews jobs. It, it, uh, uh, Richard Heinberg estimates that as we move into a post-carbon era agriculture, we are going to have to move from 1.5% of our population farming to as much as 20% of our population farming. In Canada and the United States, that represents 50 million farmers involved in, in human scale, ecologically intensive, alternate market, community focused farming. That's a lot of people. And the question is, who's going to train them? Because the universities aren't doing it, with one exception. And that's Kwantlen Polytechnic University. <laughs> we, we have engaged in something that no other university has engaged in. And we mean business. It's not a, it's not a, a, a lark. It's, it's serious business to us. It's going to take more than farmers, though. It's going to take advancing a sustainable food system is going to take all of us. It's going to take builders and leaders in all of the dimensions of, of the, the, the human society. From, from, from journalists to politicians to NGO directors, business people, you, you name it. So our, our degree program is designed to train people how to farm, but also to train people to know what farming is about so that they can perform these other functions as, as well. So I want to conclude by saying I have to tell you uh, a lot of people will offer that, that this kind of vision of, of, a, uh, of bioregional food systems, localized food systems, human intensive food systems, ecologically sound food systems that eschew unnecessary technologies is going backwards. I don't believe that that's the case at all. I think that's a ruse for not doing the right thing, for not doing the prudent thing. In fact, I would offer that this kind of food system is, is in fact, learning from our 11,000-year agriculture history, including the last 60 years of industrialization and the outcomes of it. And so this food system really represents moving forward, not backwards, and achieving what we want and need to achieve for humanity and for creation. So I won't accept that it's going backwards. And finally, I'd just like to conclude by saying that it's imperative is when we tackle the issues of sustainability, including the issue of food system sustainability, that we try to start thinking very, very differently because we are not going to solve the problem unless we can start thinking a lot differently about what it is to be human and how our food system and our economy reflects our humanity. And that ultimately, I believe, is the, is the real challenge in sustainability. Is, is, is that re, that relook at humanity and what it is to be human. This is, a, this is a challenge we can tackle. I'm absolutely convinced of it. If I weren't, I wouldn't be doing the work that I do. But uh, I, 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 I want you all to be equally convinced because it's going to take all of you to make this happen. And with that, I will conclude. <laughs>